The scripture this morning is just one verse from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, 24. The land cannot be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are foreigners. You're my tenants. You must provide for the right of redemption for any of the land that you own. This ends the reading. It's been a while since I've stood up here. <laughs> so Earth Day, it's always a bounty of riches to preach upon. Uh, so many, so many, many things. We could do it um, all year round. This Earth Day, I uh, chose the land. In Hebrew, the land and earth are the same Hebrew root, and they're interchangeable. But I want you to know that I chose the land for very personal reasons. One of my favorite books as a teenager and beyond was Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. Many of you will know the story. Maybe you read it in high school or since. It begins with the land through various dramatic events and ends with the land with the protagonist Wang Lung at the moment of his death. He has two sons, two sons who never had an experience of the land. As he takes his last breath, Wang Lung says to his sons, do not sell the land. And the two sons look down on their father who is with his last breath, and they smile to each other conspiratorially. And we know that the land has been lost. Yet I always tear up, not even thinking about it. And then this. My mother grew up in a farm in Pennsylvania on land that began being farmed in the late 18th century. It was an active farm until I was 15. Spending parts of the summer and holidays roaming the pastures, helping the dairy cows get into their <laughs> slots during milking time, raising chickens, watching the crops rotate each season. It was a halcyon time. That had a sad ending too. With no one to take over the farm, neither relatives or anyone else who wanted to farm, the farmland was sold. It was used primarily for wheat for a while. Then it was sold to a strip mine. Now when I tend the graves of my grandparents every Memorial Day weekend, I can't even go by the farm, what used to be the farm. And one more. Some of you know that I spent about 40 years with the help of many others, providing housing for persons of very low income and those with troubled pasts and troubled presence. This is a good story. At Wisfish, we were very clear that the land on, upon which we built or renovated housing was not ours to own, but rather the mantra was, we are stewards of the land with a sacred duty not to sell it. And believe me, at least once a week, Every week, I got a phone call from someone asking us to buy the land that we had built on. 
Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable, O God, our rock and our redeemer. So from the appearance of the dry land, actually the dry land was the second moment of creation after the light. The land was always considered a gift from God to be cherished. And actually not a gift wholly given, but rather a gift that was in trust to the receiver. Another way of saying the uh, scripture that Nora read, the land cannot be sold permanently because the land is mine, says the Lord, and you are foreigners, you are my tenants. You must provide for the right of redemption for any of the land that you own. In the poetry of the writers of Genesis, the land holds back the chaos of the sea. The land welcomes life, provides safety and refuge. It represents a place where all people can anchor themselves in their culture, in their nation, open fields, orchards, pastures, deserts. And it is not only the writers of Leviticus and Genesis who understand the, this concept of the provisional gift of the land. You can find it in Deuteronomy, Joshua, Exodus, Jeremiah, the Psalms, and even numbers. And in the time of Jesus, from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But back to the Hebrew scripture. You may be familiar with the concept of Jubilee, also from the book of Leviticus in the stories of the Hebrew Bible. Every 50th year, when all, there were, all debts were canceled, all lands were returned to their former stewards, it was a time of celebration and renewal, a chance to start all over again and rebalance the inequities between rich and poor, especially those who had suffered the 49 years before. And the Jubilee year had more than one purpose. As a social and economic arrangement, it prevented the extremes of wealth and poverty. Every 50th year, the land was to revert to the original owners, the descendants of those who had come before. There's a, a, just a lovely saying that I came across. The reason for the Jubilee was so that the mountains of wealth and the valleys of poverty would be somewhat leveled. You will hear of Jubilee in other contexts. Perhaps you may have experienced it yourself. When a debt was forgiven or funds were given to you freely in a moment of distress. Then and now, there is then a, an amazing sense of gratitude, of relief, of being forgiven, of having experienced grace. Today, we may think about Jubilee in connection with reparations of long ago harms to people, as well as Jubilee creating right relationships to the earth, which we have degraded. Jubilee reminds us that the land is more than just a resource. It is a sacred gift from God, and we are called to protect it. In today's world, we often forget the importance of the land and the role it plays in our lives. We tend to see land as a commodity, something to be bought and sold, used and abused, but the biblical writers remind us that the land is more than just a resource. It is this sacred gift. 
So we have to ask ourselves, how are we caring for the land that has been entrusted to us? Are we using it in ways that honor God and benefit all people? Or are we exploiting it for our own gain? The buying of large pieces of land by rich developers and transnational companies is a further blot on God's creation. And make no mistake, the huge amount of money that is exchanged through transactions like this do not come from the pockets of the buyers. Rather, they come from you and from me and from institutions who lend money that's just on paper. In today's world, we forget the importance and the role that land plays in our lives. Walter Brueggemann, theologian extraordinaire, speaks about the land being a major concern for contemporary people. He sees the land as a pivotal concern in actuality and in symbolism. He speaks about the desire of us all to have a literal place to be, which allows for a feeling of security and rootedness and community, a sense of place grounded on the land. The people Israel knew the anxiety of being landless, captivity, wandering in the wilderness those 40 years, continual fear of not reaching a land of promise where they could permanently settle. We witness this kind of anxiety with our Thursday night meal program. Guests who are homeless, who are underhoused, who are adrift. Many of our guests rent a room in another's house, in another person's home never knowing when they will be asked or forced to leave with no protection. Others in our communities who are housed in this moment experience housing anxiety as well, rising rents, gentrification, fear of having to leave New York, fear of homelessness. Brueggemann also speaks of land as a symbol. Landedness is an aspiration for many. With it comes the hope of being rooted in a place, a sense of well-being, of security, and a sense of freedom. Brueggemann in his book says something quite outrageous. <laughs> he says that the land is the central theme of biblical theology. For most of the late 19th and 20th century, biblical theology was concentrated on the mighty acts of God, top down, rather than the reality of life as it is lived. I would also say that the movement to protect the climate was a catalyst, actually, for theologians to look in a different direction, to find our capacity to, to direct our own will to have agency as persons and communities to demand change. Alarm over the creeping destruction of the climate catalyzed people and resulted in the first Earth Day in 1970. And New York was ablaze with hope and with the sense that we can do something before it's too late. And while the exuberance of that day has ebbed and flowed, there are signs of hope. And now I want to give you an example of that sign of hope as it relates to the land. First, you must know that I know very little about what I'm about to say. But what I do know heartens me. I'm speaking about the movement to creating community land trusts even in New York. What is a land trust? 
When most people think of a land trust, they think about like-minded people in communities who want to conserve habitat, who want to um, help wildlife and plants and secure good water quality. And they want to ensure the land to be available for people for generations, providing access to nature, protecting families and ranches, tackling climate change, and building healthy communities. So the last part of that definition, building healthy communities, gets my attention. Community land trusts are a model of community control over land development. However, and for me, for the heart of this work is the creation of homes, homes that will absolutely remain permanently affordable, providing successful ownership opportunities, which would provide generations of housing for lower income families. The first community land trust in the United States was established in rural Georgia in 1969. Known as New Communities and born out of the Civil Rights Movement, it was founded as a collective farm based on the land leasing concepts of the Jewish National Fund in Israel. It was an attempt by black farmers during the civil rights movement in the 60s to combat Jim Crow by establishing these self-governing collectives. And despite the ups and downs of this issue or, or this reality, it also included withdrawal of support by the Food and Drug Administration over a long period of time within the last 50 years. But yet the group has remained resilient and they have just celebrated 50 years of sustaining the land under their control and stewardship. So could this be possible in New York City? You will be pleased to know that our West Side Council member, Gail Brewer, has sponsored a bill that would establish a New York City land bank in charge of acquiring underutilized land and property in order to rehabilitate it and to transfer it to local community land trusts. A land bank that raises the money and then gives the money to local communities to be stewards of that land in perpetuity. Currently in New York, I know of New York City, I know of one community land trust on the Lower East Side that is working, is established, and is working to acquire property and lands. It is, has come out of the Cooper Square Union on the Lower East Side. But there are other groups in New York City who are trying to do the same thing. In Mott Haven in the South Bronx, where the borough president is a champion for land trusts. In Brownsville, Brooklyn, in East New York, even on Staten Island, <laughs> Chinatown, Crotona in the Bronx. The Brownsville example is very interesting because they have not only, they're not only trying to put the land trust together, but they ha have put legislation before the community to be the first land development as opposed as a strictly nonprofit model that creates 
racial and economic opportunity for the people in, in that community that has been so degraded over so many years. Because what we have now is strictly a for-profit model that prices out long-term members of communities who will become land insecure with rising rents, with no possibility of equity, and who will likely become landless. Why do you think there are 28,000 people in our shelters today? So now I circle back um, to where I began. Yes, it is important that one housing agency, at least, Wisfish, treats the land with respect. But imagine neighborhoods throughout the city of New York where low-income families and individuals manage their own land, securing their present and their future as landed people in perpetuity. May it be so. Amen. Oh,